then go oh. into restream and link the event, which is really a pain. You shouldn't have to do that, but you have to do that to make oh. it default monetization because the new monetization policy from whatever the young, like the kid program or whatever that the government enacted. So now that you can't automatically oh, right. enable monetization, you have to like manually click it in. And so they don't let you just set it up automatically anymore. It's really yeah. a pain. One more, one more piece of software to make happy before you can do what you want. <laughs> exactly. All right. Open up my, oops, that's not, that's not the one I wanted to open. So, Social media, live stream, chat. All right, got to ask the chat if everything is working correctly. How is the sound? Question mark. So Always, you asked the chat program. Eh? Oh, well, uh, I have like a, a program that connects to the YouTube chat. So anybody who's in the chat, they can tell me if it's good or bad. And okay. Tell me. So that's, that's the way I do it. Saves me a lot of time. So we're live in a chat room and then also it'll be recorded later for, you know, it's also recorded later and available on YouTube that way. Is that why we're doing it? Yep. So it, it's live streamed to YouTube mm -hmm. and lots of other places. Mm -hmm. I use Restream. So it live streams to YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. Twitch, Twitter, and LinkedIn as soon as I get LinkedIn <laughs> enabled. Like so yeah. So yep. Looks like we're good. Got about six right. or seven people That's saying cool. we're good. So. Alan, thanks for okay, coming on. Okay, six or seven is not bad. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Those are just the people who've actually typed in good. There's more people watching, but they're lazy. <laughs> they're the lazy ones. It's only the proactive people are the ones that are typing. They're my favorite. Yeah, yeah no, you don't want to, don't offend your audience, you know. You don't want to. <laughs> yeah. So, Alan, thanks for coming on. If you willing to have a conversation with me, would you mind yeah, telling sure. us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Oh, sure. So, I'm going to say a couple things about who I am in real world and then who I'm going to present myself to be today because those aren't going to be the same just to mess around. So, uh, most of my time uh, these days and for the last 20 years or so, I have been involved in academic Christian theology, uh, specifically what's called systematic theology. Although I've my publication is almost all in either philosophy. Well, I published all over the place: the philosophy, biblical studies, uh, philosophical theology, uh, straight up theology, um, and some ethics too. So uh, I'm very passionate about the environment and what we call eco theology. Um, so I've been very involved, though, since ever I uh, became a Christian as a young adult who was uh, a physicist, and I wanted to go into astrophysics, um, and very interested in the sciences and engineering, like my whole family. You know, I sort of fell off the bus on my family, all going into the sciences. So, of course, they're all way retired and have loads of money out in California, where I'm from, and I'm still working away in the humanities going... Where is the money? <laughs> the, the, so, uh, the, plight, the plight of all yeah, philosophers. The black sheep of the, the, the bad, that's exactly right. Philosophy, that's a waste of time. You can't make money with that. <sighs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I've been involved in the science and theology dialogue. That is, you know, the, and, uh, especially through the International Society for Science and Religion and various, um, things that have been funded internationally and nationally, you know, it's been my privilege to get to meet a lot of great scientists also interested in religion and theologians and philosophers and religion scholars very interested in science. So that's kind of shaped the way I think about a lot of things. I've also been trained in philosophy uh, and uh, I, I used to teach straight up philosophy of science and law. The first philosophy jobs I had when I was a freeway flyer faculty at all these colleges trying to make a living was logic, you know, informal reasoning. Uh, so I'm, I'm still very into that. Um, in fact, uh, as I got more involved in philosophy of science, I realized that, you know, we need to, I can't like Popper just start off assuming Hume's right about induction. I want to examine it. So I've published and given lectures in Europe and America on the problem of induction, trying to overcome, and I believe I've, well, I haven't solved, but I've dissolved Hume's problem. So I have great confidence in informal reasoning. I think that it gives us a lot of knowledge. It's just not certain knowledge. So uh, just to clear, so I'm going to present myself, though, on the basis of thinking about science and informal reasoning and God. As uh, not as a Christian or a theologian, but just as a philosopher who believes that 
Um, there is evidence for some kind of creator, God or other, uh, that that's probably true. Um, and uh, I, um, so although I'm, I publish all this stuff in, in theology and theology and science and uh, all this other stuff, and I teach theology for a living, <laughs> I'm uh, going to uh, present myself today just as a philosopher who thinks that the, I'll call it the atheist proposition, because uh, there's all these different understandings of what is atheism, that the atheist proposition is probably wrong. Although, you know, talking about degrees of knowledge and types of knowledge, I do think it is rationally permissible. That is, I don't think it's so unlikely that it's uh, sort of clearly not true or something like that. I think it's that both some kind of theism or other, uh, and I'll just be straightforward and say, if we're going to step ourselves to, by evidence and by reason, what we can know through formal and informal logic, what we know about the world, uh, both through tradition and our ancestors and our teachers, but also what we know about the world through uh, scientific knowledge and our own human experience and what we learned about the human uh, existence from others, uh, which is, you know, all that sort of thing, then I do think that um, it's very reasonable to believe that there is some kind of God or gods that I'm just going to call the creator. And I mean, we can get into straightforward philosophical theology, and if you like, and talk about what characteristics does the world we know and human reason tell us, you know, in a revisable and likelihood kind of a way such a creator would be like, or we could just talk about uh, something that's a creator. So that's kind of who I am and how I'm going to uh, have this conversation. I just, there's so many things to talk about that I thought it would be fun to just sort of put on a different hat and uh, and uh, come into this more as someone in logic and philosophy of science and then to examine, you know, is there such a thing as evidence for such a creator? Yeah, perfect. That's my main so, interest. Is is there evidence of God in general? Like, yeah, I've I, I watched a few. Of yours. So. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, I've I've watched some of your stuff and your fundamental position and that sort of thing. And maybe we can talk about that. Sure. Uh, a few questions first. What do you mean by what is it exactly is systemic uh, theology? Systematic. Well, systematic theology. theology is like systems biology. So I mean, it looks at the Christian religion. First of all, you know, theoretically, so it's a theoretical thing, like metaphysics is the study of being, right? So systematic theology is the study of Christian, mostly beliefs, but also how those beliefs integrate and connect together and make sense. So you're looking for coherence, you're looking for truth, you're trying to figure out, well, what is evidence in Christian theology? Because it's not... Um, it's, it, it, it presupposes, for example, divine revelation and, and the existence of God and other things like that. That uh, then, you know, once you accept, say, the Christian scriptures and Christian theology, then that counts as evidence. So, I mean, and how does it reason? And uh, but that's more methodology. Although I will say that in America, certainly for sure, we've been arguing about methodology in Christian theology for the last hundred years. <laughs> Some people have made their whole career writing books and articles just on. On, you know, what does it mean to speak about God or whatever? So Definitely. How do we know or do we even know there's yeah, a God? <laughs> for sure. My second question would be, you said you had a solution to the problem of induction. Do you have a brief yeah. uh, explanation of that? Well, um, yeah. So for me, what was really important was the difference between the kind of uh, values and the kind of practices that we associate with, system with, uh, with systems of formal logic you know, typically we would now say symbolic logic, but all systems, whether it's, de you know, Aristotelian deduction or whatever. And and the way we reason informally, I just kept pressing that these are not the same and we shouldn't have expect the same results. You know, different methods are going to lead you to different conclusions. You can't, so Hume's idea, or Descartes for that matter, that, that knowledge has to be beyond a doubt or, or that you know, I can call I can call a idea into question that's believed by painting a picture of what's logically possible. That works in deductive logic because you're dealing purely with concepts, and the logically possible worlds deal with the limits and the centers of our conceptual scheme. 
But that doesn't work in informal logic. You actually have to have a reason to doubt in order for reason to be plausible or reasonable. Otherwise, you're just making up a story to try to pretend that you don't want to believe this. So there's just all these principles. So I pressed that hard, and then I noticed that for informal logic, for example, um, what we know is traditional. It's revisable, right? Um, and uh, it's it's based on rational uh, epistemic values, right, that are shared and uh, that can be justified. And I think finally that um, in order to to recognize, to justify some of our epistemic principles, oh, and, and I also think they're contextual. And what I mean by that is uh, the different sciences and different methods have different approaches that are are like the contextual version. So you think of a value like simplicity, which is important for informal reasoning. That means one thing in biology and something else in, in, in mathematics. So, I mean, there is this sort of general vague, you know, I had this long debate with my friend Bruce Reichen about, is there, are there any general reasonable principles? And I said, well, there's, there's these families of principles that look very much alike, you know, like say simplicity or fits all the evidence or, fits with our background truths that we already know and can believe, but uh, but then what that looks like in practice is going to be a little bit different. So I guess I emphasize uh, a more communal and historical and you might say dialectical if you want to use it that way, if you understand it as something we do as a community over time. And and so uh, in, in, in effect, what I found out is the position I was working out is is not unlike the tradition, the modern tradition of Thomas Reed and Reedian epistemologists that are, uh, you know, so I would say that it seems to me that Reed at least gets some things right in his response to Hume that are important. They're kind of like a virtue. So that's kind of it. Uh, I do affirm the a virtue of epistemology, but um, I don't think it's the only part about knowledge, but I do think there are epistemic virtues to be sure. But I attach the virtues either to arguments or to theories, you know what I mean? Uh, so it's an unusual sense of the word virtue that normally we attach that to a person's character. It's almost virtue like you talk about in a long time ago, we talk about the virtue of this powerful, wonderful sword I'm making. You know, it's like it has all these wonderful virtues. It's sharp, it's strong, it's easy to balance, perfectly balance. You know, it's a virtue epistemology like that. Okay, so cool. arguments so, will have virtues. Yeah, I That's definitely agree on the fallibilism part where you don't need absolute certainty for knowledge. I don't think yeah. anyone takes that position or very few people take that position today in philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of, well, systems of logic give you and mathematics give you certain results, but outside of that, there's not, not much. Right, which is just the cognitive. I think therefore I am and that's about it. That's, that's kind of where I stop. But. So, uh, <laughs> and even that you can question. <laughs> I've I've gone through so many debates on that one because I take uh, the Kierkegaard's approach where it's a where it's a, uh, yeah. tautology. You're saying the same thing twice. The I and the thinking are the same thing, and so there isn't a further description of the I there. And so in that sense, I t I tend to agree mm. that that part is absolutely certain if you just mean them as synonymous phrases. You think it's a tautology, eh? Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, well, I'm well, an we atheist. We can talk about that. But... <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. I have I have lots and lots and lots of friends and family that are. So, uh, I, by oh, which that, I mean, I don't believe oh, there's... Oh, that reminds me, though. Oh, sure. Just let me give you an introduction really quick. So, I'm an atheist, by which I mean, I believe yeah. there's no reason to believe in a God. I don't see any evidence that indicates the conclusion of a God. I think it's all better explained by naturalism. I think that anything the supernatural mm -hmm. could explain, the unknown natural could explain. And what I mean by supernatural is just a non-physical mind doing stuff, essentially. Oh, so you want to entertain only one possible uh, non non physical reality, um, uh, and that's of. this eternal mind or something like that. Sort of. When most people use the term, and then you're denying that that exists. Yeah, when most people use the term supernatural, they usually mean some kind of a non physical oh entity or mind or intentionality doing stuff, and that's kind of. I wish that mean. were true. <laughs> they usually mean some kind of scary, weird movie they just saw. Or <laughs> vampires or yeah know, like ghosts I vampires wish anything that has a mind yeah sense. Aquinas used it but good luck with that <laughs> but yeah I I yeah so and I'm I'm going to I'm I believe you know as a philosopher 
that, uh, you know, that, that, well, let's talk about the atheist proposition. You know, ism is this you know, complicated thing. And, and there are, is such a thing as a life philosophy, even though they come in different styles that could be categorized, right? So, uh, you know, and I don't think either atheism or theism describes a whole life philosophy. It just, you know, it's a way, it's a big, big tent, let's put it that way. And I, I have this guy I know and really like, I think it's really small, Paul Draper. He's at Purdue. He's also an atheist. And he's just written about all these different kinds of atheism and agnosticism and all that stuff. So, uh, but it seems to me the atheist proposition is there, there are no gods or gods of that sort. And then varieties of atheism have different, what we call propositional attitudes. That is belief, denial, uh, uh, not you no, know, right? Uh, so, and there's, I think there's different degrees of knowledge, you know, uh, a, a knowledge that is unrevisable and a knowledge that's revisable. And, you know, we probably would agree with that, but, um, or maybe not. But anyway, so there's all these different propositional attitudes. So it seems to me the theist proposition just is there, pro there is a God or gods of some kind. And uh, this a, a non-natural being that is real and is the creator of everything. So we could just call that the creator. Right? And then uh, uh, the, the atheist proposition is just a denial of that. That's the proposition, right? I'm not saying that's what people, I'm not trying to describe the propositional attitudes. Right, sure. I don't have any problem with any of that. I would go a step further and I would take the position of naturalism and I say that naturalistic explanations are better right. than any supernatural God hypothesis. And again, by that, I just mean, because I acknowledge there is a lot about the natural we don't know yet, so we can't just place limits on the natural and what it's like. But what I specifically mean by the natural versus supernatural distinction is that there is a mind, some kind of intentionality that exists outside of brains that is causing things, like a, a, a first cause mind kind of a thing. So that's... Yeah, right. What, what, what yeah, what the medievals thinking. would call the first cause, exactly. Well, I, I grant the possibility... Although they pack of, a lot more into it than I do. <laughs> well, I, wanted to, I want to grant the possibility of a first cause, but the first cause can be purely natural. You don't need a mind for that. Um, I was in Taoist for some time. So what about the Tao? The Tao is beyond person and non-personal, beyond good and evil. Uh, it's a spiritual, eternal principle that brings about all the variety and all the things we see. Is that the creation? Should we ignore that? Uh, yeah, because you're not talking about a mind or a person there. You're talking about some kind of ultimate principle. Right. I would say it's just matter and energy in motion. Nothing more. Nothing less. I'd say that there is nothing more. Nothing less. No, I said there's probably some necessary cause to the universe that exists mm. before space time, and I'm totally mm. fine with that. But I think that's probably also mm. a natural something. Not has no intentionality, no consciousness, no oh. uh, okay. thought, no knowledge. It's just an, essentially just a kind of energy, mm. just energy in and of itself, kind of like that. And that itself can be some the ground of, of existence. Of energy. Okay. That could be the Tao then. That's possible at least. Uh, depending on how you want to understand Taoism. Most Taoists religions interpret the Tao in more personal and moral ways than that, but that's another topic. So, uh, okay, that's great. So I would actually like to talk about, too, since we're trying to lay the groundwork here, but this is what philosophers do. They explain, they explain okay, here's my logical principle, here's my definition. It takes half an hour to have a 10-minute conversation about anything substantial. It's ridiculous. Okay, so... Uh, Conceptual, empirical, metaphysical, right. So, I mean, I think the idea of reality, if that's what you mean by metaphysics, for me, metaphysics is the study of things that are real as being. In other words, if you're trying to philosophically study the categories of being as such or in all these beings, right? Right, I put that into ontology, so, uh, which is a subset of metaphysics. Yeah, all right. So then, uh, but this, this, the point is metaphysics is the study of something. It's a meta-discipline. It's not the same thing as reality. Uh, so I, I would probably just use the idea that certain things are real and certain things are not real, where you, I think, talk about metaphysical. But then empirical is epistemological term, right? I mean, wouldn't you say the empirical, I mean, it begins in the Western thought, you go to someone like Locke or whatever, as uh what can be known through the senses? And of course, we've had to revise that over time to what could be known in principle uh, to the senses, you know, in theory. So 
we would agree, I think, that the temperature on the North Pole of Venus is an empirical fact. Uh, but, you know, we, we, neither of us can go there. And we can't even send a robot there. It would be totally destroyed. You know, so well, actually the Russians did. The Russians did, actually did send one to Venus. So, Oh, yeah, that's true. They did. But uh, so you have to also extend it through technology. That was my second point. So it's not our senses, but that it's data that can be collected and measured through our scientific technological uh, instruments. Uh, detectors is what we usually say in philosophy of physics. We just put random detectors. Into detector A, detector B. Um, so, but we, you know, we can allow for all of that. But then there are real things that are not empirical in the sense that we believe they're real, but they can't even in principle be detected either by scientific technological uh, instruments or by the senses. In fact, in quantum theory, of course, they call those virtual particles. And the, that doesn't mean their e existence is doubted which is the way virtual is meant today, I think. But rather that we know them through their power, that is their virtue, their virtu, that we know them through their, their power. So I think that there are things that are real, and I'm just talking philosophy of science now, things that are real that we accept are real on the basis of conceptual, mathematical, uh, and, 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 and logical principles like simplicity, uh, even if we can't, even in principle, detect them or experiencing them. Would you agree with that? Um, not exactly, because we know through the Casimir okay. effect that we can detect virtual particles through measurement. So I wouldn't necessarily agree that we can't detect virtual particles. Well, I think it depends on what you mean to detect. You can detect their effects. Right, right but, but I, I suppose I, in a lot of quantum mechanics, that's just all there is. You, well, we can do the same thing with the detect. cosmic microwave background. We detect the effects of the Big Bang, and, and we count that as the kind fact, of the verification yeah, of the Big Bang. Yeah. So I, I'm totally fine with just looking we at We count it as, oh, yeah, no, I, I, I see. So you would count as something like the cosmic background radiation, we believe conceptually and through, through rational reflection and, and scientific uh, deduction, induction, that the best explanation for that is, a, you know, some various theories of the Big Bang, you know, initial singularity. But, of course, we can't actually, I would say, that's a not empirical thing. You know, maybe we're just disagreeing with, with the word empirical. I don't think that the Big Bang is empirical. I think it's real, and it actually happened. But what's empirical is the cosmic background radiation. See what I mean? And then our speculation, whether it's mathematical, logical, or probably and typically a combination of all of those things, uh, philosophical and mathematical, our speculation about such things leads us to conclude with a great deal of certainty that certain things are real, even though they can't be detected. They're not empirical in that sense. Right. My so question... I might be using the word empirical stronger than you. Whereas I get the funny feeling by empirical, you mean not an epistemological category, that is something real, which also happens to be detectable and knowable in that way. But right, just in that, in that sense, you're right. I use it as an ontological category. I'm saying things that have been verified by some kind of empirical test. It doesn't mean the thing itself is empirically verifiable. That means we have a hypothesis that this thing exists, and then we make predictions about what the consequences of the thing are yeah. going to be, and we can empirically verify those consequences then I count that hypothesis itself as having some empirical verification. So it has the ontology of being mm -hmm. empirical by my categorization. So it so, isn't just the epistemological root there. I'm not using it in the strict sense that you are. Okay. All right. Well, that's good to know, just in case we get in a mess about that. But I guess I would call a lot of those things just physical instead of empirical. Because, in other words, the physical, the empirical is the subset of the physical. Well, I, I would but, I definitely <clears throat> do that because you can have empirical verification yeah. of non-physical things perfectly fine. Like if you say, I believe there is a non-physical God and I pray to this God for a gold brick and a gold brick appears in front of me, that would be sufficient mm -hmm. empirical evidence for the God from my perspective, even if the God wouldn't be self Oh, empirical. okay. The evidence is empirical. This is where we're getting into the slipperiness between ontology and epistemology. Yeah, the gold brick is empirical. The evidence is empirical. The God is not. Right. That's, so, so no. in my classification, God is real, but not empirical. <laughs> right. So my classification is just that. if the thing <clears throat> has empirical verification, then the hypothesis is an empirical hypothesis. So it doesn't actually matter if every part of oh, the, the, no, the hypothesis no, no, is empirical. No, no, no. All that you need is some empirical verification. Then it has met that level yeah. of being evidence of an empirical status. 
So it doesn't need to be the, the yeah, hypothesis yeah, yeah. itself doesn't need to be empirical directly. It just needs to have that level of evidence. Well, that makes God empirical then, which is uh, sure. very strange. I think that you that maybe the way you use the word is could be confusing to some people. But let's clear you clarified it, and I understand it. So even if you believe in something, because then that explains why you if you you want to talk about conceptual evidence leads to conceptual things. Actually, most of the things, and especially the things we can't directly detect uh, that we believe in through scientific knowledge is a combination, as you say, of philosophical, logical, mathematical, and empirical. And so uh, then to call those things empirical seems to me a bit odd, but I get what you mean. And so I'll, I'll take that into... into right, I did want to mention as long as right, we, that the God I, would be a, an empirical hypothesis. If you could if pray to a God and get a gold brick, then I would oh, count sure. the God as well, empirical at that stage. My God is an empirical hypothesis, okay? The way I'm presenting myself today, the God I believe in is an empirical hypothesis, okay? That's exactly the God that I want to talk about. Although I would say a real hypothesis that we believe in for a combination of empirical, conceptual, rational evidence. So you, but you believe that there are these different types of evidence and they can combine together to lead us to a very likely conclusion, right? Yes. I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, All right. okay good. So then, then we, can, we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't agree with that, it was going to be hard to have this conversation. All right, so I think that's enough prolegomena for God's sake. <clears throat> so uh, what I'd like to present then is the idea that just really this is very traditional. You know, goes back to Plato and Aristotle, but that the order and structure of the universe as we've come to know it uh, makes it likely. Uh, more likely than not, uh, that there is such a creator being. And um, one of the things I want to say is I have a lot of skepticism about what people say about the laws of nature, as if these are somehow eternal, rash, necessary structures that aren't contingent. I mean, I'm much more of a Aristotelian for the laws of nature than a Platonist. I mean, I think that they are but what we mean by the laws of nature are, if you go back, for example, to Newton's classic mathematical, mathematical, it's a mathematical description of the regularities of nature that we discover, right? And that are contingent. I mean, those regularities could be different. So, I mean, uh, so for me, they then say these laws of nature are like eternal. I, I, yeah, I find that to be difficult to accept. Um, because it seems to me that, that what we have learned uh, in modern physics, anyway, that nothing that is natural, physical, uh, can endure forever. All natural things have a finite past. Uh, well, and I, don't, I would take issue don't with that. Forever. Black holes, for example. Well, I take issue uh, with that a little bit because of the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah. Energy can never be created or destroyed. So even if, for example, black holes oh, can decay yeah, because of Hawking yeah. radiation, the energy is never lost. Yeah. So the physical energy can't be destroyed. So it's not everything in physics can be, not every yeah. natural thing. No, I don't believe decay. that. No, that's not true. Um, I've studied thermodynamics significantly. I've written about it. And that is a law for we humans in our mathematical calculation. That is not a metaphysical law. It should not be applied. To ontology, it's not true. Energy can be created. There's nothing illogical about that. There's nothing non non rational about that in metaphysics. In physics, though, if your equations don't come out with the same energy on both sides, you've made a big mistake. So it's just a presupposition we make in mathematical physics. I don't think it has any ontological value. So energy, I mean, what is energy? Energy and matter are fundamentally the same. If you can create matter, you can create energy. And there's nothing uh, necessary or necessarily eternal. The physical universe, the universe of energy, just isn't eternal. There's no reason to believe it, and every reason to doubt it. Well, as so, far I mean, as I, I know, think most, of the, say most is, of the theories in physics say that even if we take the extreme to the mass cold death of the universe, all of the energy that was mm. in the Big Bang is still there. Like nothing is lost. All of the different like the information they say is always conserved. So it seems like nothing, there's no energy that's ever lost there. The energy is the same, both at the beginning and the end. Uh, useful energy though, what in thermodynamics they all used to call work, that's gone. Absolutely. Right. But the, but the particles themselves, except that 
if there, if if the particles themselves deteriorate, which seems to be a quantum phenomenon that is well well respected or well confirmed, then the particles themselves may deteriorate. I mean, you may get down to something so effervescent it'd be hard to call it a thing. It certainly would have no organization. Right. The particles. And then the the remember, physics the assumes the idea that you know physics presupposes the idea that there's matter and energy. It, uh, it it bases that conclusion on just sort of everyday reasoning about the world. Right. I believe like, the consensus it is that, it. that matter yeah. is an emergent property of the fields themselves. And so it's the when the yeah, matter decays, right. it just decays into the field. And so the field itself is the energy. Right. The field is the source of the energy. But then where does the field come from? I mean, uh, there's the philosophy, in philosophy, we always ask these kinds of questions. So no, I think you're right. I agree with that uh, in quantum philosophy, philosophy of quantum mechanics. That uh, consensus view is that matter and energy, as we know it, right, the kind of energy you study in classical thermodynamics, uh, results from from the fields. That somehow the fields themselves are just there, and we just presuppose they exist and keep going. Uh, and that's the way all the sciences work. You presuppose certain things and you keep going. None of them give you a complete truth about reality. Uh, I don't think any discipline does. Well, if it did, it has to focus down, right, in order to gain truth. So yeah, my my basic view then is that it gives you a very good reason to believe, you know, where it, it, can, it can answer the question philosophically if you accept some kind of uh, creator being of why there is something rather than nothing, which is, you know, always been an important philosophical question. It's one that uh, Heidegger in the 20th century press many times. And uh, it also, in philosophy of, of science and philosophy of physics, helps helps you with the metaphysical question of why are there fields and why do they have the values that they do? How, how so? Uh, you know, cause cause that's the part our of... description of field is not the mathematical structure, right? It's the actual thing itself, the energy, power, structure, potential energies themselves. Right, so here's here's the question that I would have, which is, you claim that the existence of these fields and laws, the order and structure in our universe is evidence of a designer of some kind. But it seems to me yeah. that that would not be the case because just like the physicist presupposes the fields are just there and they have these properties, you seem to have the same problem and have to presuppose there is this designer that is just there and has these properties to create the oh, fields. Right. So it seems like they have the same problem. One is just right. one less extraneous variable there. One would just say the fields are just there and yours says the fields are there plus the God is there who created the fields. So the fields themselves would just be a simpler hypothesis, wouldn't it? Well, no, actually, I think that uh, that God is a simpler hypothesis than the fields of quantum mechanics. I don't know if you've studied that much. They're pretty complicated. Um, but if by simpler, you simply mean parsimony, you, know, you presuppose one less being. It does have that virtue in its favor, but it has the, the problem of not, not having an explanation. So uh, in the Western tradition, the idea of this creator God is of a, the very concept that is, is, uh, of a being that has no creator and is eternal. Okay, so the concept of this God is the God that, that if you ask who created this creator, you're asking like, what color is the number three or something? I mean, <laughs> numbers don't come in colors. The image you have of the number you write down with some sign may have colors, but numbers don't have colors. All right, I totally agree. That's so, the uh, definition of God technically understood, but that seems to be like an arbitrary label you've just asserted towards this being, and we can assert it towards anything. We can assert oh, it towards okay. an apple, no, or we can assert it towards the, the yeah, fundamental yeah. fields and say, so it doesn't yeah. actually, the fact that you define God in this way doesn't no. actually indicate that's the truth. That could this property of uncreated could apply to the fields, and that could be the truth and not to this being. And so my question would be is, why do you presuppose that this God having that property is simpler than these fields having this property because it seems to me if the God could create the fields, the God is necessarily more complicated yeah. than the fields. Um, yeah, let's. you brought up a number of different things and I want to talk about them uh, one at a time. So let's talk about explanations, right? So uh, the fields existing, just presupposing them, is no explanation. That's just the assertion of a, a surd. That is something that you just accept it is, and there's no explanation for it. But everything about we know about the natural world tells us that physical things, including matter, energy, and the and fields, 
uh, are are contingent, right? They they are brought about by other things. We look naturally and logically, given the character of these things, we look for some causal reason. And absolutely much of the impetus behind developments in physics has been looking for more and more causes of things that we took for granted in the past. Um, the nice thing about uh, this hypothesis of God, which is not arbitrary, by the way, that the God hypothesis was developed through, uh, well, ultimately through the Jewish understanding and experience of the God they, they had, or whatever that, that is. So the development of it is not arbitrary. It's based on uh, the, the, it's based on the Jewish scriptures combined with uh, Greek philosophical thinking. So I don't think of that as arbitrary. It's not like we're just making this up because we want to have some, you know, picture or other. We, we want to just get out of this problem of where did the fields come from? Where, where did the initial singularity come from? So uh, just so clarify, I don't, I don't what I mean by arbitrary in this context is that I, you have this idea of this property of being uncreated, and you claim that this property applies to a God for certain philosophical reasons, but it seems those are kind yeah. of unjustified. We can just claim this property exists towards anything. I can claim there's a pineapple that is the necessary thing, and that all of the things that make it up are just smaller necessary things, and so the composite whole is a necessary thing. And so we can make the same claim about the the... The uh, fields themselves. The fields themselves could just be necessary things. Like you assert they're contingent, but I don't. I think most philosophers would disagree on most of that, especially like ones that are working on emergent yeah. space time, like uh, Sean Carroll and Nima Arkani Hamad for the amplitude hedron. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like we can say those are the necessary thing that is not contingent, just like you claim that yeah. your God is not contingent. It's the necessary thing, and it doesn't seem like that the physicists are are less justified to do that than you are. It seems like they're actually more justified to do that. No, yeah, I find the idea of emergent space-time to be uh, philosophically questionable. And uh, I would point out there's no evidence for that. There's no, uh, no evidence. You know, you can, you can create all kinds of mathematical solutions to the equations of general relativity. It doesn't mean those things are real. Right? That just means they're, they're possible. Right? They could exist. Um, so, but if you'll let me get back to talking about different kinds of explanations and uh, whether something is arbitrary or not, or whether something is simple, uh, the, the God hypothesis is a simple being that we believe in already for reasons that have nothing to do with quantum theory. And so in that sense, uh, it's not arbitrary. The Western tradition and Western culture and Western thought developed these long before anything like modern science was even around. In fact, you could argue, and has been argued historically, one of the reasons we even use the phrase law of nature is we are imagining that there is this law of nature. So how, I how wouldn't say that the belief in such a... It's not arbitrary in the sense that the being is already there and has been used in our culture long ago uh, to explain some things. And so using that being now to explain is not purely arbitrary uh can you explain a little bit more not in physics right? well, well, i'm talking need, metaphysics here. so i would agree it's not ad hoc in that sense ad hoc is just a hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, asserted to explain new data or whatever but it still seems like mm -hmm. the foundation of the entire concept of a god itself was arbitrary regardless of what you use it for in the future so if the concept of a god came about in an arbitrary fashion like humans made it up, right. then anything you apply the God to is going to be an arbitrary application of this thing. So you need some non-arbitrary yeah. evidence that this thing exists, independent of the fact that people just came up with it earlier. That doesn't make a difference. Like people can come up with an arbitrary, like uh, random tribbles or Klingons or whatever, and that would be arbitrary for some yeah, I know reason. And when applications to that in the future yeah. would still be arbitrary, even though it came before. So it seems to me that the entire concept of a God itself is just arbitrary. And then people are using it as a god of the gaps to fill in unknowns in knowledge. Yeah, I, I would still resist this idea that God is arbitrary. I, I agree that the concept of God was developed prior to, say, modern physics. Um, but the idea of God that was developed over many centuries in Western culture is not arbitrary. Uh, there have been lots and lots and lots of good arguments, rational, well-founded arguments about the character of such a god. Uh, and the nature of such a God. So um, the, I, let's talk about different kinds of explanation. Maybe this will help. So 
The idea that there's a God who brings about something is a very basic action. It's a very simple hypothesis. And it has to do with personal explanation versus a naturalistic or physical explanation. So, so far, when we've talked, at least today, and when I've heard you before, the only explanations you seem to accept are physical ones. And I think that you're going to end up with a very limited life philosophy if, if you really consistently do that. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. So, I mean, well, do you allow that an explanation, a causal explanation can just be that some person or group of persons decided to do this? Like if I ask, uh, you know, why did the orchestra all, players all come uh, to this room today with masks on or something? I mean, I could give a very long and detailed uh, medical, purely physical explanation of the muscles and the movements and all of that. Or I could just say, well, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the maestro called for a uh, in-person um, rehearsal. And so that's a personal explanation. All right, absolutely. So you can at use the level um, of John Lennox's example of why did Aunt Mary bake the cake? Well, he did it for so-and-so's birthday or whatever. But that's, right, I'm, exactly. when we're talking about explanation, I'm talking about so, the prior cause to the thing in question, not the things it does. So, for example, if there's a God, what is the explanation for the God? And if you say, well, it's self-explained in some there sense. There is no, yeah. Right, that, right. So, there is so the just, asking just something to, that doesn't make sense. Right, right. So, that's, that's, so just to continue wait, 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 on with what I was trying I was, to say here. No, 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 no. Just I'm, give me a finish second, my point yeah. just a little bit. So if you want to say God oh, well, is self-explained, so I. I can just say the, the fundamental forces or the waves are yeah, self-explained yeah. and it's exactly justified yeah, that's equ point. equivalently. So just asserting it's self-explained no, is nothing. It's just an arbitrary assertion and we can make the same assertion. Yeah, I, don't, I don't agree. And the reason I don't agree is uh, that, first of all, believing that God did it is a very simple hypothesis because God had already a pre-existing idea and it's already been used in the culture and by our ancestors and teachers uh, that for this very idea. So that... The next thing is, though, it's the same. I would get back to the point I was trying to make before, which is the concept of the God that's been developed in Western thought, uh, and not only in Western thought, certainly in Hinduism, is a concept of a God that is creates everything and doesn't have a creator. Um, and that's been worked out and questioned and discussed and clarified. So that it, is, it is a coherent concept. Whereas it seems to me that the idea that the fields are necessary and or space, time, and the laws of nature create themselves is the incoherent concept. Everything we know about these things suggests that that's not metaphysically possible. I'm not saying you can't speculate it based on uh, contemporary physics. It's just the arguments you're making, whether the scientists know it or not, are metaphysical arguments, and as such, they don't seem to be plausible. So I, I find it plausible and very difficult to believe that uh, the fields are self-generating or, and I don't, I don't think that's an arbitrary statement on my part. I think it comes from our understanding of the nature of matter and energy and quantum fields themselves. And remember quantum, in the study of quantum theory, they just presuppose these, these fields. There is no well-developed, established theory over where the fields themselves come from. We have right, but that's theory. still necessarily simpler than presupposing <clears throat> God. So if we presuppose these things we already oh, know I don't exist, think so. then it's necessarily simpler than presupposing these things we have no evidence for exist. So obviously yeah, it has to be right. simpler to presuppose that something we know exists is necessary than something we don't know exists is necessary. Just adding in that extra feature of something we don't know about and calling it necessary is obviously yeah. an unnecessary addition to the hypothesis. Yeah, parsimony, though, is not, is not a high-ranking virtue in theory choice. Uh, if you haven't been able to explain the evidence, well, you need sometimes a more complicated theory. Complicated in the sense of adding more additional beings, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, once you... Uh, I, I, the, the idea that the universe sort of is self-existing, self I accept that that's a rational position to have, but it seems to me... Uh, it's less rational and it's more rationally satisfying. And here we're just talking about the aesthetics of reason, I think, almost, to uh, affirm some fairly unknown eternal mind or being of some kind that's not a natural being, for which these metaphysical attributes have been clarified and, and reified over centuries by really smart people that lived long before we did or long before we had modern science. Right, so and, if you grant uh, those additional... that, and it, because it makes the 
it, it's a simpler hypothesis. It's simpler to say that such a God, once you presuppose this God, just brought it about, uh, than it is to say that all these things sort of accidentally happen, especially when you bring in not just the, the initial singularity, but the fine tuning problem that you and Robin had such an interesting conversation about. Right. So, so the, I other, the last see, I thing I want to say, the last thing I want to say that makes the hypothesis of God not arbitrary is there's a variety of reasons to believe in God. There's a variety of types of evidence and arguments, and they they kind of have a cumulative effect. So it is absolutely not arbitrary to apply God here, especially since there are other arguments and other reasons besides where does why is there something rather than nothing, or where did the universe come from? Uh, that you might appeal to the existence of such a being. So again, I think the idea that it's arbitrary or made up just for this is, well, you know, I don't accept that, and I don't, I don't think it's a reasonable position just because there's so many other kinds of arguments that have been given for the existence of God of such a creator. Now, um, I will say at the end here that the creator I'm talking about is not necessarily a moral being, right? I mean, I'm talking about some kind of creator that is, you know, beyond good and evil or something like that. All right, what so, uh, Draper calls aesthetic theism. Okay, so there's a number of things you brought up there that I wanted to touch on. First yeah, was the, okay, the, the variety of evidence you brought up. So I reject all of that. You have to pretend like I've never heard any of it. So I know of no evidence of a God at all. There's been none that have been presented to me whatsoever. So which means I have no background knowledge of this. It's just the only I've heard is you've asserted this thing exists. And so your okay. assertion that this thing exists with no background evidence is clearly less plausible than the assertion of the physical things which have been demonstrated and can be represented by empirical mathematics that we can demonstrate in reality. So this is clearly a better hypothesis because we already know this exists and you're just asserting this additional thing we have no, I have no evidence for. Um, in addition to that, you, you mentioned it's not a moral being and I can grant that, but I had a conversation with um, one of the leading physicists on the fine tuning in the world, Robin Collins, and he explicitly said mm -hmm. that the fine tuning problem does not at all indicate a designer unless you add the additional moral argument to say there's a reason why the design takes place. And the reason for that being is that if you want to say that a God created the universe as it is for some reason, it is equally or simpler to hypothesize there is just a quantum particle that created the universe exactly as it is, and that quantum particle had this particular nature that was intrinsic in it, just like you believe God has this particular nature which is intrinsic in it. And so the fundamental premises of the argument are exactly synonymous. We have, you believe God is this perfect, this being that has this particular nature for no explained reason other than itself. I believe there is this particle that has its own particular nature for no other reason than itself. And so those justifications end at the same stopping point. Mine just has less yeah. additional properties like consciousness. So mine is already better and mine is already grounded in things we know exist as opposed to yours, which yeah. is grounded in consciousness, which we only know to be a contingent thing that exists as a composite. Yeah. So you mentioned a number of things. I, I think at this point I would say, well, we, uh, if, if you were going to be serious about what you said about not knowing about God through any other arguments, that just means you have a lot of, of books to read. I, mean, I don't well, see I, that as a counter argument unless, you know, well, uh, we, your, your we would argument have a presupposes lot that they work. So your argument presupposes that these work in some sense. And no, the vast not majority... that they work, but that it's not arbitrary. Now, I'm not saying they work or that they're valid and true. Just that the idea of God's not arbitrary. That's all I was trying to deny. Well, if I said like the other thing a cat is, is a dog, a dog is a chicken, therefore a chicken is a cat. The other thing I mean, is, that, that is, would be an arbitrary. You know, your idea, yeah, your idea of a quantum particle that has consciousness. That again seems to me to be it's it's not an empirical idea. It's not something that we we can hypothesize except as a very ad hoc way. I think. Does so I would say that the, the idea that God, that there is such a God, is not arbitrary. It's based on multiple sources of, of argument. It's based on tradition, you know, which I take seriously as something that does grant us knowledge. I mean, I don't want to have to go out and learn everything myself, for God's sake. And uh, even though I reject much of the tradition, you know, uh, and I'm not a Christian or any kind of religious person, I still think this is an interesting and valuable idea. And the, in terms of personal explanation, the idea that God created it, uh, and I want to come back to this because I want to say one more thing and then we can go back to what you want to talk about, um, is uh, when I say aesthetic theism, and I'm borrowing this term from Paul Draper, what I mean is God does have reasons for creating the world, right? But they're aesthetic, not moral. 
So there are values in the world of beauty, right? Not just in the world of morality. So I know Robin Collins. I, I think he's he's great. And he's been working on the fine tuning argument a lot and knows a lot more about it than I do. But uh, I do think that you could say, you know, that God is beyond good and evil and is, is not immoral, but not moral either kind of thing. And then say, but what God does value is things like beauty, wonder, novelty, you know, these other aesthetic values. And on the basis of that, God made a reasoned choice to create a world. Uh, and, and Draper calls that aesthetic theism. So, I mean, I think that's what I'm trying to present today in, the, in, in discussing, you know, is there argument for God? So I would just, again, finally press, and maybe we just disagree about this, that the idea, some of these ideas attributed to physical things or to uh, uh, field theories, um, it just seems to me that, you know, we're trying to give these an ontological power and virtues that they just don't have, that we have no reason scientifically or empirically to believe that they have. Whereas there may not be a God, but if there is a God, at least in the, the tradition of Western philosophy that, that we're having this debate in, um, then uh, that God already has, comes to us with these well-developed and defended coherent properties. Uh, there doesn't mean there is one. Uh, but it does mean that you know this God creator being um, is not arbitrary. We're not. It's not an arbitrary appeal to such a God uh, as a creator of the universe. On the contrary, it's what Plato and Aristotle and vast majority of Western thinkers have been saying for centuries. Anyway, what do you say back to that? <laughs> Sorry, All right, so yeah, the, the first thing I wanted to address was the past arguments, evidence, and tradition you mentioned, like if you use terrible evidence, like it's essentially like rolling a dice, which is arbitrary. So if you say cats are dogs, dogs mm -hmm. are chickens, therefore cats are chickens, clearly that's a bad argument. The fact that people came up with it many years before, it's still arbitrary. It's just a, a, like rolling a dice or flipping a coin. It's just random gibberish. So you can't say that a thing concluded for by that argument is non-arbitrary. It clearly is because it's just a bad argument. So if all the arguments presented for this God that you're uh, espousing are non-justified, they're just complete gibberish, random nonsense, then the God would still be arbitrary. And so if there is no evidence for this God existing prior to this the fine-tuning, then, and all of the arguments are just arbitrary in the sense of just being nonsense, which most of the secular philosophers and scientists tend to agree they are, they don't usually agree with them in many cases, then they would not work as a justification to presuppose this God exists, and you, so you could not use it as a simpler explanation. You would essentially just be positing this God exists, adding it to the addition, uh, adding it to the theory, because there isn't any prior evidence to it. It would be something else you would need to justify, making it a less simple theory, um, if it, you don't already grant this past evidence exists. Um, the second thing was the the ontological powers and virtues that you mentioned of like we the I forget what it was it's the you said equations are possible but not necessarily true and that's that's true but all equations are based on things that have an empirical verification uh, all of the physics all of the equations in math are only combinations of principles particles and laws that have been verified they're not allowed to just add in any new equation they want for fun they have to have an empirical basis which means they have already filtered yeah. out some of the imaginary equations that so they, get, they can't just add in for fun. Whereas our philosophical concepts have not filtered those out. We can grant that many of the philosophical concepts people come up with are just purely imaginary. There's no basis in reality at all. They're just Klingons, Tribbles, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, whatever, or other kinds of a gods that would not be justified by the traditions that you're espousing. I imagine you would agree there. So those are also imaginary. And so the Traditions mm -hmm. that you are supporting seem to be unable to differentiate the purely imaginary from the non-imaginary, whereas the mathematical equations are very, very good at doing that. So it seems more plausible to base our beliefs on ontology in the mathematical equations rather than the philosophical arguments because the arguments don't seem to work as well as the equations do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, just a few things. First of all, maybe you should interview more atheists who are philosophers of religion. You know, the ones I know and have conversation with, you know, Bill Rao, who's not with us anymore, or Paul Draper or Robin LePedman, they would not say that the arguments for God are random nonsense or people just made them up. I think that's, um, 
that's just dismissing what is, in fact, a fascinating argument that been people that really, really smart people, smarter than you or me, have been doing for a really long time on both sides. It doesn't mean, okay, it doesn't mean there is a God to say that it's not nonsense to believe there's a God, that these arguments are not just nonsense or randomness or things people made up because they they could. I think you're going a little too far there. You could say you don't believe them. So when you finally said, well, there's scientists and there's philosophers who don't accept the validity or soundness of these arguments, I agree with you on that. But they would not say, I don't think. It's just random nonsense where people just made things up because they felt like it. That's maybe too strong. The other thing is in mathematics. So actually in mathematical physics, they do invent formulae because they because they want to, because it makes sense. And the reason is not for empirical reasons. It's for the aesthetics and the, the, the rational conceptual aesthetics of simplifying the equations. So if you look at, for example, the, the use by Einstein of the square root of negative one, which mathematically can't exist, right? But he uses it as a calculative simplification and comes up with formulas that then can be tested. Okay, then those can be tested. But if you look at the initial move in that direction, it wasn't based on empirical data. It was based on, on the, the virtues of mathematical formulae and theorems and models, right? That, that it's simpler, that it, it brings together all these other different equations. So again, I would say that um, maybe, again, this is going back to my use of word empirical versus yours, so we can, we can drop that. Uh, so I guess I want to say that, you know, you should interview some atheist philosophers of religion to talk about arguments for the existence of God, because I think they'll find out that uh, it's not like they believe that there is a God, but they find the God hypothesis worthy of careful, thoughtful study, uh, and not just something random and arbitrary nonsense that people made up as they could. Finally, if you want to talk about nonsense, I would, I would prefer to use the word incoherent. I think a lot of the attributes that are being given to physical mat material things are incoherent. Incoherent with what we empirically can have sound, tested, experimentally tested knowledge of, right? I'm not saying that they're, they are um, dumb or stupid or pure fictional or made up. I don't believe any of that. I think they are doing their, there's an edge to where people do, especially scientists they'll do this speculative work beyond what the evidence says right in order to try to speculate a little bit further ahead of the evidence and see what might be possible okay and so i read a lot of what people write about you know even you know physicists uh, write about um the origin of the universe the naturalistic origin of the universe in that way i i respect it but I think in the long run, they're trying to add attributes to physical things that they can't bear. Uh, and so I have a problem with that. And maybe this is, we're finally getting after all this now, at the fundamental difference between this is I have conceptually and rationally as a philosopher, I have problems adding these attributes to a thing that seems to have opposite attributes. And I find it much simpler and more elegant, kind of like postulating the square root of negative one, if you will, to use this God hypothesis, uh, which we have from the Western tradition, and so it's not arbitrary, and it's, it's a respected viewpoint of very many smart scientists and philosophers over time, uh, and, and just say appeal to that in a very, very limited way, very limited way, just as a a philosophically satisfying uh, position, um, metaphysically, not pretending that it's science or, or, or physics or anything like that, but just a metaphysically satisfying position. Okay, so definitely a couple things there. The first one is what I mean by random nonsense is the inability to distinguish between uh, imaginary and reality. So the obviously they wouldn't use the term random nonsense that's proprietary towards my epistemology they they do agree with me because i haven't interviewed a number of them i've talked with uh oz ozzy ramsius um i've looked at the gram op videos lots of gram op videos so i have talked yeah gram op is another one 
definitely. So they agree that most of these arguments don't actually indicate anything, or they're very, they're definitely not even close to being successful in any way, um, which yeah. I would then would fit into my classification as random nonsense. I would use those terms to describe something <laughs> that is very unsuccessful. <laughs> that's um, but that's a little insulting, actually. But, yeah. Apologies, I don't mean it to be insulting. It's just the language I would choose, I would use in in my context. <laughs> but it seems to me that those arguments cannot differentiate imagination from reality. You can make up similar arguments for different kinds of a gods that have no bearing on reality and like the spaghetti monster or whatever. And there are many <laughs> traditions I like of the spaghetti monster. Me too. There are many traditions of other religions making up similar arguments that indicate completely contrary gods yeah. that have, obviously, you would agree, have no bearing sure. on reality. And so it seems like that tradition yeah. of using those kinds of philosophical arguments is not a successful way to differentiate imagination from reality, whereas mathematics is definitely. Um, you mentioned there are definitely mathematicians who did make stuff up, like Pauli just made up, pulled an equation out of his butt, essentially, to, to do some really complicated mm -hmm. physics. And then it was verified. After it was verified, then it was accepted. Right. Like, yeah. But before then, it was just something he right, made up. Right. And so the verification process does give us right. a way to differentiate. Is this imaginary or real? Right. Yeah, it's, it's real because it gives us that testable thing. Like in the beginning, right. I, I mentioned that my definition of empirical is like if it is empirically verified, then it has empirical levels of, of evidence. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you literally mm -hmm. saw it. So, But based on your traditional argument, we could say that if the Romans had a tradition of Zeus and... Uh, their tradition of Zeus can then be applied to seeing lightning and say, well, since we have this tradition of Zeus existing, well, it's parsimonious to say mm -hmm. or simpler to say, Zeus created mm -hmm. lightning. And that is something I would cl clearly say sure. is an arbitrary addition there. Like the idea of Zeus was completely ar arbitrary. They said, oh, lightning, uh, well, we make sparks with hammers. That's probably a big guy with a hammer or something. So it seems like an arbitrary conclusion to let that led to Zeus. And I think the same thing is going on when you say God uh, created the universe. It seems like you've come up with these this prior tradition of this thing existing, and then the origin of that thing is based on faulty arguments. Um, and then using those faulty arguments, you're then saying, well, it's simpler to say because of these arguments, we can then conclude it explains the physics. Whereas again, looking at the math, because math does provide a very solid way to differentiate imagination from reality, it seems much more plausible to ground. Yes, I believe it does. I mean, would you disagree? I don't. You don't. Yeah, I would. I would say that you can do all kinds of things in imaginary with imaginary numbers and using your imagination in mathematics. The uh, sure. so that yeah, it's, the other thing is I would say imagination is an important part of informal reasoning too. Absolutely. I mean, so, that, so, uh, so I'm not saying yeah, imagination is so, bad. I mean, the idea that you imagined it doesn't mean that it isn't a rational idea that you are coming up with. Oh, right, absolutely. I totally wouldn't wouldn't disagree with that at all. But you did need some way to differentiate. Is it just imaginary? Is it just a thing we've made up, like tribbles right. and clingers? Right, or is it real? Exactly. Yeah, and if yeah. you don't have a method to do that, then simply yeah. your imagination of it is not sufficient to believe it does yeah. exist. So you need something to do. And my point is the, the structure and reality and existence of the universe is the empirical evidence for belief in such a God. So therefore, it's not. It may be imaginary in the positive sense of, you know, actually, it's not imaginary at all. I didn't make it up. No, I don't know nobody really imagined this thing. It's it's there. Let's go back into the mind of your Roman, right? So you're a Roman philosopher, and you actually really do believe in Zeus. Okay, this is just something you made up today. And you see this lightning bolt come down and destroy some evil person, right, that's been oppressing the poor or whatever. It's perfectly rational, actually, for that philosopher to believe that Zeus did that. I, I can't agree with you that it's... Uh, irrational in that situation for that person, right? It well, would seem I, to me that it is rational. I would add, so I would, I would say that belief there. in God is is not imaginary in the sense that uh, you, are, you are proposing a hypothesis that in your use of the word empirical is empirical. And uh, while, while you are you're using what Peirce would call abduction, that is you are going beyond the evidence to hypothesize, because, I mean, hypothesization is a form of imagination. You're hypothesizing such a being. You are neither arbitrarily picking it up randomly, like hanging on to something. You are using a piece of the tradition that, that is a part of your whole cultural background and baggage and history. It doesn't mean you have to believe that, right? So, I mean, uh, look at ether, right? I mean, people had this idea of ether, and uh, they use it in all kinds of perfectly respectable physical ways. It turns out they were wrong. There is no ether as they understood it, right? 
But it doesn't mean that, say, Maxwell's understanding of, of, of the equations are, it was wrong because there is no ether. So, I mean, people have ideas that are false that they accept, right? It doesn't mean their reasoning at that point is, is uh, dubious or, I mean, you and I probably believe a lot of things that aren't true and everything. Uh, so, I mean, I, 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 I take it that we're disagreeing on a couple of things. Maybe one is the value and purpose of imagination in both mathematics and in science. And the other is um, this use of the word arbitrary to talk about the imagination that goes into an empirical hypothesis. Now I'm using the word empirical. Either. Now, I don't see that as arbitrary or random or nonsense. Okay, so yeah, the first thing it, would be... It may be false, but that's different. Right, right. we definitely have nonsense. justified false beliefs. We can be justified in believing something based off of evidence and that well, belief can be false. It's perfectly fine. But if it's not justified, that's where I see the problem. So if you had a belief in Zeus simply because you, you rolled a dice and said Zeus existed or something, that would be an unjustified well, belief. That's arbitrary, yes. Right. And so that's what I see the arguments for the existence of God to kind of be like from my perspective. So it seems to me just like rolling a dice, we came to this conclusion, and then we're going to use this thing to conclude and mm -hmm. explain other things, which is why I call it arbitrary. And I agree with you with the importance of imagination, absolutely. We, everything starts as imaginary. You mm -hmm. can't, like, every idea we have has to come to us in the form of an imagination. But oh, you need okay, the good. additional way to d filter out, is, is it there. just imaginary, or is there some justification to believe it exists outside right. of our imagination? Right. And that's the key right. difference here, is I don't think the arguments that are presented in the tradition give us that justification. I think it's more like the rolling of the dice and saying Zeus oh, no. exists. No, they don't have to be just And here's the difference between having some evidence and being justified, right? So wouldn't you agree, though, that if I have some evidence for a belief, it's not just arbitrary that I have that belief, even though I may not, you know, I may later, a later version of myself may look back and realize, well, I wasn't really justified in that that in fact is false. So, I mean, I could, I could believe someone is my friend, for example, based on the evidence that I have of everything they've said and done. It turns out they were my enemy much later. And that, uh, so that, but at the time I had some evidence for it, even if, I really thought, thought about who that person was and all the things they'd done and said. I might sus begin to suspect that maybe they're just using me. They're manipulating me or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But I just didn't think about it that much, and I just accepted it. So it seems to me that a justified belief uh, is you're talking there about knowledge, uh, whereas uh, I want to say that belief in God is not random or arbitrary because there is evidence in its favor, even if you and I would disagree about whether that evidence justifies uh, a, a low level of knowledge or a strong belief or whatever that there is such a God. So, I mean, I'm just trying to point out that there's some evidence. I wasn't trying to argue with you that, that it's justifiable to believe in God based on that evidence. That's not what I meant. Oh, I'm totally fine. There is some evidence. I'm happy to grant that. So I would say if it has evidence, it's justified. I'm, I have a really low bar there, so it's not very hard for me. Um, but I would say there oh, isn't okay. any I have a high bar for justified. Right. If you have a justified belief, then you know that thing. If I am justified in believing P, then I know P. Right. <laughs> so, but, I mean, at least that's my epistemological language. Right. right. So I, I'm, just, I'm just using them synonymously. If you have evidence, that's totally fine. I'm, I count that as justified. I'm happy with that. But I don't see any evidence. That's the problem oh, I'm having. No. I see no evidence. No, evidence is much much weaker than justified. You you usually need a lot of evidence to get to justification. And you can have evidence for some hypothesis or belief that is well below justification. So Right, I'm just I'm just making it simple here. So a, what, if what you're is perfectly the evidence? rational, you'll have a different you have a different um, a different propositional attitude. Oh, right, right. I'm happy to just Besides, have a really low bar here and just call them, if you have evidence at all, I'm happy with calling that justified from my perspective. So what is the evidence you have? Because right. I don't see there being any. I would still point to those traditional arguments and I'd say the universe itself is the evidence. The structure, purpose, existence of the universe itself is that evidence. And then there's also things like beauty. And if you accept objective moral principles, which not everybody does, uh, you you might find that uh, there's some value in the moral argument. I mean, Kant certainly did uh, for the existence of God. I myself, speaking strictly as a philosopher, as a theologian, I believe that. But as a philosopher, I'm not sure that I think that it 
How do I want to put this? If you already believe in such a God, then the existence of that God is a good reason for why there are objective moral principles. But if you don't already believe in such a God, then uh, there are other ways to talk about the, the reality of objective moral truths that don't involve God. And maybe the difference between us here at this point is I apply that way of thinking to the moral argument for the existence of God, and you want to apply it to all the arguments for the existence of God. So if you already have some reason or other to believe in such a God, then fine. You, you know, it, it's a simple hypothesis. Or whatever. But right, if you so don't have any reason, then why would you believe it based on this? And I, I guess I want to say, you know what is... Uh, there have been a huge number of really smart people throughout the all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, who, although they were raised to believe many gods and all this stuff, they actually rejected all that and uh, and believe that there is some kind of, you know, whether a demiurge or a creator or something like that, in order to explain the, the laws and principles of the physical world. So I, I just think that calling that arbitrary just seems to me, or having no evidence. I'm, I'm okay with not having justified belief, not having sufficient evidence. We could really get into the weeds about that, but just to say there's no evidence seems to me a bit, uh, well, idiosyncratic on your part, let's put it that way. I'm fine with that. I, so I, from I, my perspective, like you mentioned the distinction between if you already believe a God exists, then it's reasonable to apply a God to explain these things. Like I totally agree. If you well, believe a horse exists principles. and you see a horse print and you see a print in the snow, it's reasonable to say it's probably a horse print because you already believe horses exist. But I'm coming from the perspective, I have no prior reason to believe this God exists. So I'm saying, what evidence is there to conclude that God exists at all before believing it exists? And the evidence you gave was, well, the fine-tuning, but to explain the fine-tuning, you, you already need to appeal to those other reasons. Yeah, I was, I was appealing to a variety of, of arguments. We'd have to look at them. But basically, they boil down to the cosmological argument and to various types of design arguments. Um, and then I, I do I do find the argument from the not just the order, but how do I want to say this sort of the beauty of the structure of the world suggests, I won't say proves, uh, some kind of mind behind the cosmos. And that may be one of those things where it's just a basic belief for somebody. You know, they look at the stars or they they contemplate the beauty of of crystalline structures, or or they, they look at the way life keeps finding a way to come about and merge and, and grow, it. and they just say, there's got to be some uh, design here. And I guess I have to be really careful at this point because, uh, and I've distinguished this before, I'm not a believer in what is usually called intelligent design theory, right? In other words, we appeal to God, you know, to explain the origins of the life or something like that. But I am trying to push forward the reasonableness of what I call a macro design theory. That is, that it's not used as an explanation in any of the sciences, but it's a metaphysical proposition that explains what we discover in the sciences without being part of any of those sciences or trying to make an argument with any of those theories. So I, I do think things like the macro design and, uh, and the, beauty, the beauty, you know, that sort of aesthetics of creation. I don't know how else to put this exactly. As well as the fine-tuning argument is just another form of it, along with the cosmological argument. It does make me feel like, you know, there's, there's some evidence to affirm the existence of this, this eternal creator. But, yeah. I, I, you know, if we can allow, allow what is rationally permissible, you know, I think the view I am espousing today is rationally permissible. And I think your view is also rationally permissible. Uh, but we're, of course, what we're talking about here is truth. You know, are, they, are they real? And that's a different, much higher layer of, of necessary evidence. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I wanted to address, so from the perspective of someone who has no prior reason to believe in a God, 
The cosmological argument seems to be better explained by some unknown natural force. It seems to say, it seems to always be simpler to take the known things and say there is a new property of the known things than there is to assert some new ontology like a supernatural god being that is outside of all the known things, which seems to be what you're doing. So it seems like the hypothesis that there is purely a natural explanation, some unknown natural thing there that is the necessary grounds of the, the origin of the universe, the cosmological argument, seems to be a better explanation than there is a completely new ontology of things to explain this. Um, and it always seems mm -hmm. simpler to say, well, if there's this completely new ontology that is self-grounded, we can just say there's this new property of nature that is self-grounded. That still seems to be simpler. Second was the design argument you mentioned. The design argument seems to be the same thing. If you have a properties, a certain set of properties, like all of the different laws of physics that need to have some certain fine tuning to create a life in the universe or whatever. Um, just asserting that all of those properties were somehow tied into some quantum particle that had a certain nature to it seems to be simpler than saying there is a particular God who has a particular nature to create all of these laws exactly this way, as opposed to all the different other kinds of gods that could exist, like one that just wanted black holes, like Stephen Hawking's God, or one that only wanted mm -hmm. pink rabbits or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it seems like of all the possible gods, there's equally as many variety of possible gods that could exist. And so the God itself has to be even more fine tuned than the universe itself in order to explain the universe, whereas so just saying the universe is itself fine-tuned or just a brute fact that explains itself would be simpler than saying there is a God that is a brute fact that explains itself. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also beauty. You mentioned so, uh, beauty, just to clarify that. So beauty as a basic belief, yeah. that seems like that wouldn't qualify as something that you could believe without a prior reason since a basic belief is a prior reason in and of itself. Uh, well, sometimes you have the basic belief happens to you. So it's not a prior reason based on that. But I would be happier in a rational way with you saying it was some unknown force. It seems to me to say some unknown physical force is to uh, pack the unknown with a certain reductionism that may be overly narrow, let's say. But the other thing, we get, keep coming back to simplicity. You know, Imagining this quantum particle that has these properties is incredibly complicated. And I'll just come back to the idea. The idea of God is very simple. It's a simple concept. God is not a complex being. God is a simple being. Uh, uh, and uh, the attributes of God are, are ones that we deduce through reason, right, uh, based on what needs to be the case for, for such a God to be the eternal creator of all things and uncreated by anything else. Um, and so these all flow from the same basic fundamental idea, whereas uh, a quantum particle, I mean, think about what, everything we know about a quantum particle, and then you're adding all these other things on top. That does seem to me to be rather arbitrary. And I also find this arbitrary, the idea that the unknown force, I think is much more rational for you. <laughs> I'm giving advice here. You don't have to take it. Free advice is exactly what it's worth. It's worth exactly what it costs, right? That just to say some unknown force seems more plausible, more reasonable, and then, you know, maybe we'll find out more about it later than to stipulate the metaphysical character of that force in advance. And so I would just, I guess I'm coming back to this idea that the, the physical idea, however we're imagining it, of, um, that's the origin of the universe to seems arbitrary and uh, incredibly complicated. And I think when you say God is complicated and has to be fine-tuned and all that, you're imagining God's made up of parts, but of course God is not made up of parts. God is simple. So uh, at least you know the classical God of, of the medieval Jews, Muslims, and Christians. That, that's the kind of God they, they, met, they, they developed with in their region. Uh, so I, I, maybe we've come down to some sort of basic disagreements here that we're probably not going to make much more headway on. So oh, I'm sure, maybe. What the person means. <laughs> so a few things would be like, uh, you mentioned that an unknown force is better than stipulating uh, a force of particular metaphysical characteristics. And I would agree yeah. with you, but that seems to me from my perspective, what you're actually doing, you're saying there is this God that has these particular metaphysical characteristics. And I'm saying, right. no, it's probably just an unknown force. Uh, and it seems like that hypothesis is far <clears throat> better for the exact same reasons you're describing than to yeah. posit the yeah. metaphysical characters of yeah. the God at all. And this, you mentioned that yeah. God has these attributes and these attributes are simple. I think the attributes are kind of like 
abstract concepts that we've come up with, like a chair. Like a chair as a concept could be very simple, but the things that make up a chair are actually very complicated. To have a chair requires right. a lot of complicated things, even though the concept of a chair is simple. And so these attributes of a god may seem simple because they're abstract concepts that we've made up, but they could actually be extremely complex, far com more complex than anything else. So just assuming that because we can label these attributes in a simple way doesn't mean that the attributes themselves are simple. So how could God be simple? Because the, yeah. From what I understand it, many philosophers consider God to be not simple at all, like the least simple thing possible by definition. Yeah, I know that. That's a, There's a big argument about that, but I'll just state here that uh, two things is uh, the idea of God is not arbitrary, and I've already tried to give you reasons for that. It's uh, been developed, it's been used by philosophers, and I'm using it in my philosophical presentation for exactly the same reason that Plato and Aristotle, for example, used it. So I, I don't think that this is arbitrary or made up or coming up with some new category of being that never existed before. And I would point out, though, that the sort of super particle that you're talking about is something that's new and arbitrary and made up just to explain the universe. And nobody really imagined um, before, say, 100 years ago. Um, but the other, the other point I guess I want to make here is I think we're still arguing in a circle about what is arbitrary and what is simple. So you get, but I'll give, I'll, let's take up the, uh, the chair, okay? The chair does have parts, that has complicated parts. God has no parts. And so metaphysically, ontologically, God is a simple being. Now you might say, well, what we think about God is complicated, yes. But it doesn't make the thing complicated if what we have all these long lists of very, we find logically complicated ideas about that thing. So, and then the complexity of hypothesis often depends on the complexity of the thing that you're hypothesizing and how many of them and how many powers they have to have, right? Uh, and so the simplicity of a being is not the same thing as the simplicity of hypothesis. So I think it's a very simple hypothesis to say God, God created it this way whatever values God has. That's a simple hypothesis. And then I would say God is simple because God is ontologically simple and has no parts. Right, so, so, so I would agree with the first one. I'd say God hypothesis. doing something would definitely be simple. If you already presuppose that God exists, then the God doing something is particularly simple, like mm -hmm. saying, I exist, I can flip a switch. If you already know that I'm made of trillions right. of particles, and yeah, that's pretty simple for me to flip a switch. But the problem I have is with the first one. The idea that God itself is simple seems completely incoherent to me. Like if a God can create a universe, then okay. obviously it necessarily has to be more complicated than the universe it's creating. It seems nonsensical to say that it's simpler no. than the thing it creates, because that would create a mathematical paradox. No. If you have a no. God plus the universe, the total mm -hmm. net complexity must be negative, because the, the, the universe has to the God has to be simpler than the universe it creates, which causes a very strange problem yeah. for how simplicity could work. Yeah, actually, that's, I don't believe that at all. So if you use the artistic example, for example, um, you know, imagine an artist is just a disembodied mind, right, and can just, just make pictures and words appear. Uh, so that, the, that being is a very simple being, but they can create in words, this incredibly long, detailed, and complex novel, you know, multi-volume Russian novel, right? So the fact that a being can create something that's complex does not mean that that being is complex. I, I can't, uh, I can't allow that to be a legitimate deduction. It seems to me wrong. So I mean, yes, God, the universe is very complicated. It doesn't mean the truth. Creator is there's a there's a big gap there rationally I think in one or the other. I don't quite understand your analogy. Well, I, I'm ready to uh, I'm kind of ready to be uh, done with what I think I'm going to try to argue for, but I I want you to have a chance to talk to and tell me how messed up I am about this. Oh yeah, so I mean I think I've articulated my position pretty clearly. It seems like mostly what yeah, you're arguing yeah. is that because again you're, I don't think I don't follow your analogy there of a, somehow a simple being can create things because it seems like all the things we see are not actually creating anything. They're only just manipulating things that already exist. So if you truly uh, create something like 
from nothingness, uh, from ex nihilo, that seems to be extremely complicated and not just a simple yeah. thing. Um, and so the idea I was of, using an artistic analogy, right? Analogy, right. Right, and I would say the same thing about, applies to all the analogies. We don't see anything that actually creates the idea of creation ex nihilo that out of nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's that that idea seems. You see to things me, that create, you know. We all create things, but we don't create out of nothing. That's right. Yes. Right. yes. So, so our ability to create is limited based off of the materials we have at hand. We we only just reform the materials. Essentially, the materials already exist. Yeah. The creation from nothing part is the part that that's really complicated. That's not a simple thing. There, you think it's, that's complicated? Yes, I think it's simple, but I think it's very simple. You just make it happen. Boom! Like uh, the best analogy I have is you imagine something right now, some proposition or some picture in your mind. You've created that right now. Boom! And I think God creates the universe like that. Just does it. It is very simple process. I don't think that's a simple process at all. I think the trillions of <laughs> we have a hundred billion neurons, a hundred trillion yeah. connections. Our ability to imagine propositions yeah. is extremely <laughs> complicated. The, the process for God is simple. The output that's the, the product. Pro, that's the product and uh, process distinction. There, the process is simple. The product is complicated. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that would be a good point to disagree on because I think the, the process has to be <laughs> okay. even more complicated. Well, than I have to say that I haven't had this much fun for a long time talking about philosophies. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to a conversation. Yeah. Well, and I think what we've done is, you know, we've come down to some fundamental differences, really, that are philosophical. I mean, I think we accept a lot of the scientific things we're saying, but... Um, at some point, you realize it's just a different way of looking at the same things and coming up with different ways of thinking about it. But thanks for this conversation and for your hospitality and your openness to discussion and dialogue. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. It's been great. Our, we're, our culture right now in context is so, so acerbic and so... People don't have conversations at all like this. It's just to have this uh, yes. rational, you know, open, respectful point of view discussion is awesome. So thank you for that. Appreciate yeah, it, man. Absolutely. I really enjoyed right, the conversation. Well, I'm going to say now as the real me, you know, God bless you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe we'll do something again sometime. Absolutely.